The African dwarf frog is an amazing little freshwater pet that is widely available and a lot of fun to keep. In this video, I'll discuss how to care for them, as well as common problems you might encounter with them. Welcome to Chris's Fishes and Frogs. African dwarf frogs are sold at many pet stores and online as well, although depending on where you live, you may need a permit to buy one. Dwarf frogs are actually multiple species and come in a variety of darkish colors, greens, grays, and browns. There are also blonde dwarf frogs to be found. I owned one briefly, but I don't have very clear footage of him because he was sickly looking when I got him and he didn't live long. African dwarf frogs are frequently confused with African clawed frogs because they can look very similar when they're young. Pet stores may have them in the same tank, under the same label. Be aware that if you get a frog who seems especially confident and whose limbs are nice and plump, it may be a clawed frog instead. The easiest way to tell the difference is in the front legs, or hands. Dwarf frogs have webbed hands, while clawed frogs have separate digits, or fingers. The albino coloring is also more common to clawed frogs than to dwarf frogs. Note that despite their names, clawed frogs aren't the only ones with claws. Dwarf frogs have the same three claws on each hind leg which they use for ripping apart shed skin and food. If you end up inadvertently with a clawed frog, know that your pet is going to grow many times larger and will have distinct care requirements. Once big enough, a clawed frog will consume any smaller frogs or fish that it can catch. Unlike most other amphibians, dwarf frogs don't need access to land. They are fully aquatic, meaning they live their entire lives in the water. However, they breathe with lungs, so they do need to surface every so often to take a gulp of air. This fact, combined with their small size, less than 3 inches or 8 centimeters long when mature, makes it a good idea to keep dwarf frogs in relatively short tanks. A 12 inch or 30 centimeter tall tank is safe, although taller tanks are possible depending on other factors, like the speed of the current and the availability of perching spots for the frogs to more easily access the surface. While dwarf frogs tend to stay around the floor of a tank, occasionally darting up for a quick breath of air and then quickly back down to relative safety, they also enjoy resting on floating plants or other decorations from time to time, especially if they're feeling lazy and just want to poke their mouths above the waterline for some effortless air. They also sometimes float just under the surface of the water with their limbs stretched outward. This funny pose is normal behavior. On the other hand, if your frog is completely out of the water, that's a sign that something's wrong. Dwarf frogs can't survive very long on dry land. They will dehydrate and eventually die. If you find your frog completely above the waterline, your pet may be attempting to flee the discomfort caused by a toxic spike in ammonia, nitrites, or nitrates in the water. This is the best case scenario, as it is temporary and can be mitigated with large, repeated water changes. In the worst case scenario, a dwarf frog who voluntarily stays outside the water is probably suffering from chytrid, a common fungal disease that's not only plagued pet dwarf frogs, toads, and salamanders, 
but also devastated wild populations of amphibians around the world. Chytrid is generally fatal. Very little can be done for infected frogs, but you should still quarantine the sick if you hope to prevent spread to other amphibians. I myself have had seven dwarf frogs climb out of the water and die shortly thereafter. Chytrid was the most likely cause. If you're in a store and the frogs have fuzzy white spots or red blotches, look elsewhere. Funguses and bacterial infections are highly contagious among frogs. So if one is infected, it's quite possible others are as well, even if they don't yet display any outward symptoms. Just know that even with healthy looking frogs, a disease such as chytrid might still be lurking secretly, only to rear its head a month or more after you purchased your pet. Another common problem that affects dwarf frogs is bloat, or dropsy, where the frog's belly and or limbs balloon up far out of proportion of its normal body size as fluid builds under the skin. Bloat is not well understood and is probably a symptom for more than one illness. If your frog starts to resemble a balloon, please know that your pet is likely in great discomfort and could potentially die from the underlying illness. My recommendation is to do research into potential treatments or to seek the advice of a veterinarian. Because of their absorbent skin, dwarf frogs are very sensitive to aquarium medicines. Be sure to take due diligence before applying anything to your tank other than water conditioners. For dealing with chlorine, chloramine, ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate in frog tanks, Fritz Complete and Seachem Prime are two excellent water conditioner choices that have worked well for me. Avoid handling your frogs, for both their sake and yours. Chemicals on your hands can be toxic to them, and your frogs may be carrying harmful bacteria like salmonella. Use a net or gloves to move them. African dwarf frogs prefer temperatures anywhere in the 70s Fahrenheit or mid-20s Celsius, and a water pH between 7 and 8. Although they breathe air, some aeration in the water won't bother them, and indeed might be beneficial to them in helping to regulate their internal systems through their skin. Mechanical filtration is not an absolute necessity, but will be tolerated by your frogs as long as the current created isn't too strong. Dwarf frogs are small and weak creatures and they'll have difficulty surfacing to breathe with too strong a water current. I myself use a sponge filter with minimal airflow, and my frogs have no trouble swimming all around the tank. A controversial aspect of aeration and filtration among hobbyists is the extent to which aquatic frogs are bothered by mechanical vibrations, as one gets from, say, an air pump. As far as I can tell, no one really knows whether such buzzing really affects frogs negatively, but it's probably best, if you can manage it, to place vibrating machines away from the tank on a surface that will absorb most of the movement, like carpeting or a thick towel. For the same reason, you might consider avoiding the use of a hang-on back filter, which will inevitably vibrate the tank more than a sponge filter will. You should also be mindful of the kind of substrate you use in your frog's tank. I myself prefer a bare bottom. My frogs appear to enjoy scooting themselves across the smooth glass looking for snacks. And the bare bottom is very easy to clean. If you instead use gravel, it's best to use rocks that aren't so small that they are easily ingested. If your frog is unable to spit out or to pass a rock through its digestive tract, your pet may become impacted, which can lead to health problems and even death. Sand is another option for substrate. These particles are so small that frogs will likely ingest them, but will probably have little difficulty passing them. <laughs> 
Another consideration regarding materials in your tank is what kind of decorations to include. Frogs love to hide, and you should give them plenty of spaces in which to do so. If your frogs are left out in the open, they'll become stressed and their health will suffer. Fake and live plants are excellent choices, although liquid and powder fertilizers should generally be avoided. I myself use only root tabs, which are buried with the roots instead of directly applied to the water column. Very large rocks and other structures are good decorative choices, as long as they won't trap a frog who is trying to surface for air. Make sure any roofed structures can be vacated somewhere near their top. Otherwise, your frog may become confused and unable to reach the water line in time to breathe. The general rule about tank sizes for aquatic pets is that bigger is always better. Yet that rule doesn't apply perfectly to dwarf frogs. As previously mentioned, too tall a tank runs the risk of dwarf frogs drowning. In the U.S., a 20-gallon long tank is an excellent choice. Short but very roomy. A 20 long can house many frogs or frogs and friends. I wouldn't recommend a tank smaller than two and a half gallons for a single or pair of frogs. Anything smaller will run the risk of frustrating your pets, which will eventually cause stress and ill health. Obviously, the more frogs you have, the bigger your tank should be to allow them to find some alone time. While I've never had a frog escape a tank, I've heard many reports of them going AWOL, so you'll want some kind of lid. I also keep my water line a bit lower for them than I normally do, just to cut down on the possibility of their exploring beyond where it's safe for them to do so. I've often heard dwarf frogs described as social creatures who enjoy the company of their own species. That has not been my experience. Every individual animal has a different personality, and maybe my dwarf frogs are preternaturally shy, but I've seen absolutely no evidence of happy interaction between them. My African clawed frogs are definitely social, but my dwarf frogs are not. If you have a mature male and female, then at some point you may find them locked in embrace, the male clutching the female from behind and on top. This can last up to a day or so. The usual result is fertilized eggs all around your tank. If you're interested in trying to raise tadpoles, you should probably care for them in a separate tank, as the parents will see their hatchlings as nothing more than a delicious treat. As for sexing your frogs, mature females tend to be larger than males. Males tend to develop small white or pinkish bumps behind their front legs or arms. Males will also make a buzzy humming sound to call for a mate, usually at night. As for other tank mates, dwarf frogs can be kept with any other freshwater pet that is not so big that your frog becomes a meal. I keep mine with Corydoras, which are miniature catfish, and this has worked reasonably well. Dwarf frogs are very slow eaters, so you want to make sure that any other creatures you keep in your tank will not outcompete your frogs for food. If you keep, say, guppies in your tank, you will definitely want to target feed your frogs individually. Even my Corydoras, which are fairly slow feeders compared to other fish, will gladly gobble up an entire pile of worms on the tank floor before my frogs even notice they're there. And as mentioned earlier, African clawed frogs are not good company for dwarf frogs. If you discover you have both, separate them immediately before your dwarf frogs end up on the wrong side of the food chain. Dwarf frogs mostly eat meat. They can be tricky to feed because of their slow swimming, small size, and poor eyesight. So be sure to check out my video dedicated solely to feeding your dwarf frogs.
African dwarf frogs are cute aquatic critters that are relatively cheap and easy to care for. If you can get a healthy one, it can make a fun little pet for up to five years or even longer. If you have other advice on dwarf frogs you'd like to share, or any questions, please leave a comment below. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and consider subscribing to the channel. This is Chris's Fishes and Frogs. Thank you for watching.